warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Islamic Relief Canada and our wonderful team here. Um, as you see, some of us will have uh, Tim Horton cups. This is kind of Canada's best uh, uh, export, um, most proud export uh, to the world. Um, we have our wonderful team here and we'll start off with introductions. Uh, we'll start off with a wonderful married couple in the office, our in-house married couple. Uh, so Abdullah, take it away. Assalamu alaikum, my name is I am the National Volunteer Coordinator here. Uh, what else do you want to know? That's good, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Cool. Assalamu my name is Rida. I am the Marketing Manager. Uh, my name is Amna. I'm part of the Programs Finance Team. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Yasmin. I'm the uh, Fundraiser and Outreach uh, Coordinator for Western Ontario. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Yusra. I'm the HR Coordinator. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Asma and I'm the Donor Care Coordinator at Connor Care. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Umair, I'm the fundraising coordinator. You skipped the old man? No. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Hanid Banna, I'm a volunteer for Islam. Assalamu alaikum, Zayda Rani. He's the CEO. He's the CEO of Islam Relief Canada. My name is Mahmoud Qasim, I'm head of fundraising at Islamic Relief Canada. And I'm Osama Khan, and I'm the Director of Finance at Islamic Relief Canada. So we thought we would just have a casual conversation uh, with all of you today about some of the success stories, challenges, and the way forward uh, that we've experienced here at Islamic Relief Canada. I guess just by way of a, a bit of a brief history and like a success story for uh, our office, uh, we started in 2007 uh, here in Canada, in Ontario. And uh, over uh, the span of uh, 10 years, we've, alhamdulillah, grown to uh, close to $20 million in revenue. Uh, we have a staff size of uh, 25 uh, wonderful people, uh, a young team. And uh, so we'll start off with uh, just success stories that people want to uh, share. Hi, Asma. Yes, I can, I can start with the uh, orphan success story. So. Um, just uh, the past few weeks, we were notified by Islamic Relief Worldwide that we're sponsoring a total of 50,000 orphans. Um, out of that, uh, since I started working at Islamic Relief Canada, um, we've gone up from about 4,200 to uh, about 5,300 and um, still counting. So that's about a little more than 10% of the total that uh, Islamic Relief Canada is sponsoring. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's been a big success for um, that I've witnessed uh, over the span of a uh, <coughs> year and a half that I've been in Islamic Relief Canada. Um, so take it away, guys. <coughs> um, being the outreach uh, coordinator for Islamic Relief, um, I find that we've been able to uh, break a lot of new ground. Uh, there's a lot of new communities that are very eager to jo join Islamic Relief. Uh, they're very happy with the work that we do. and. Uh, uh, one of the things that they like to see is some of our um, success stories, uh, some of our success, the results of their donations and how it's being used, and to be able to be involved in that. Uh, and it really is empowering to be a part of that team. <coughs> I can share one uh, from the volunteer side of things. Um, we had about seven months ago or so, we, we probably only had maybe 500 volunteer signups. Project myself. Your voice is one. Oh, sure, yeah. We, we, about seven months ago, we probably only had uh, around 500 signups for volunteers. But in the past seven months, uh, we've been advertising uh, ways to get involved a lot. So we've grown up into I think 1,300 or so um, in our in our volunteer data database. Um, but one success story that comes to mind is uh, I won't mention his name, but he's, he's an awesome brother who's been helping us out. He first started out in a convention, so we had uh, just like a regular booth uh, set up in the bazaar area. Uh, so he came with his buddy uh, just to help out with the shift. He ended up coming for uh, he's for uh, two other conventions after that. But then, what was amazing was this past Ramadan. Um, Ramadan is obviously the busiest time of the year for us, right? Uh, him and his friends actually took care of the entire East End, uh, and they would go to every masjid that was scheduled for every single night for the 30 days. Uh, they would help out with the collections. They would help out with the fundraising. They would help out with leafleting. They would answer people's questions as they exited the masjids. Um, so this is someone who went from being just a very, very casual uh, volunteer to becoming one of like, literally our, our all-star, I'd say right now. Um, and I hope that, you know, we, we see more of that as time goes on, because really just, there's so many people that are getting uh, ready or, or looking to get involved, and it's just a matter of us, you know, uh, giving them opportunities and outlets to, to express their volunteerism. From my perspective, I think what's even more uh, impressive or a success story than our revenue growth 
is kind of the culture uh, that we were very proud to have created here at Islamic Relief Canada. Um, as you can see, uh, a lot of us are, are young people and young leaders in the organization. And just uh, providing a culture for all of us where we can learn uh, a comfortable space to make mistakes, uh, a chance to um, you know, create magic and, and add value uh, to the beneficiaries around the world. For me, uh, that in itself, uh, you know, we talk a lot as a community about empowering our youth. And I think we uh, have a, a, a shining example here, uh, not just for Canada, but around the world that uh, the youth can make a difference. And, uh, and that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. For me, the single biggest success story <laughs> is our ability to help our teams in Lebanon, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan do the amazing work that Islamic Relief is doing. It's really um, heartwarming that we're reaching out, telling people in Canada, hey, look, this is what your donation translates into. And they're saying, wow. And they give, and they give, and they give more. And our teams are working tirelessly. Daimi in Lebanon, Manchima in Pakistan, you have Shabal in Bangladesh, and all over the world, people are just working really tirelessly to fulfill that amana that's being given to them by Canadian donors. So I'm really impressed with uh, uh, the fact that we can do this, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. uh, something I'd like to share with, uh, especially this Ramadan being a busy season for, for a lot of us in fundraising, it was very nice to see the the kind of encouragement you hear from the, the community uh, and the type of things they say. You might have someone who's a, a doctor, a specialist, and they come up to you and say, you know, I wish I could do what you guys are doing, or I wish I could be in this kind of work. So sometimes, you know, for us, we take it for granted, but uh, it is a reminder again that, you know, so many people look up to this kind of privilege or honor that we have to be able to work in this kind of environment and help out those in need. Uh, and uh, and it's very important that you know people are able to to see this and for us to appreciate this and and for our team from the library day we come to work uh, not just seeing it as work but something we enjoy doing and something that we want to be a part of to help as as Zaid said uh, you know our friends across the world who need who need this more than we do in Shami. so it's it's quite a daily success in my opinion for us in Shami. Um, I'd like to share one. Um, just recently, uh, after Ramadan, Mahmoud uh, shared a few pictures with us um, from a few, few, a few distributions from throughout the world. Um, it was just it was very heartwarming to see the smiles on people's faces when they get a little bit of relief that there is someone out there, um, there's someone out there that cares for them, that helps for them, and all the all the hard work that we put through Ramadan makes it that much more easier to to put that effort in. When you when you can see the, sort of the impact that that is being made, so just in a nutshell, that 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 really really shows what what an impact uh, every little every little effort makes. Following along that, um, we see pictures all the time that we get from the field uh, with regards to beneficiaries. But then meeting beneficiaries is a whole other thing. Uh, when you go and meet uh, the boy behind the picture that you're marketing to everyone, it's it's really heartwarming. That's when you know that what you're doing is totally worth it and the people you're helping, that, that is the true success is what they said. I really like the fact that, uh, as I had mentioned before, that we're um, gaining more ground and we're sharing the vision and the work that we're doing in Islamic Relief. It uh, really excites me and gives me more energy every single day that I wake up and come to work and that I want to be here. I'm excited to be here. And when I hear and I find that other communities, like uh, new masjids, that for the first time they're coming on board with Islamic Relief, they're so excited that they're also um, campaigning to other masjids. They're speaking to other masjids and other people in their community to reach out and to help out because they see the results. The results are there and they're real. And it's not. Uh, any skill or talent that any one of us have, but in fact it's a uh, reflection of Allah Azawajal granting all these people that are in need when they raise their hands up to Allah Azawajal and they ask of Him, the one who gives. We are only a means of delivering their, their dua. We're not anything special but committed in order to help and we're privileged as Mahmoud had said that we're a a means of delivering that du'a to them. Alhamdulillah.
I think one thing we, we aspire to do um, is to be the beacon of light or the role model charity uh, in Canada and around the world. And, and that's something that we think about every day, to, to have an institution, uh, to have a, an organization that is run very <coughs> professionally, um, that is uh, inspiring, that is compliant with all of the regulatory environments, that is cutting edge uh, in terms of the marketing, uh, that it does, uh, that has wonderful controls in place uh, in terms of finance, uh, and that really uh, is something that uh, the, the charity space, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, uh, can look to as a model organization. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, this, this kind of pivots into, uh, I think it's a success story, but there's a lot more to do, and it's a never-ending <coughs> goal for us to kind of keep on aspiring to become uh, and to remain uh, that model charity for, for all of society globally. And um, you know, I, I think this pivots us nicely into, into the challenges that we face. Um, this is not just our organization, but, but in the current uh, political uh, global climate that we live in, uh, there's uh, a lot of challenges when you look at um, even the social, uh, the social issues of uh, inequality uh, between the rich and the poor, uh, when you look at climate change and when you look at the decisions that um, that the governments uh, and, and, and their uh, regulations are. Uh, I think in our space, that's a challenge for us. Um, and, and that's something that uh, we need to continuously monitor and, and work towards. So one of the successes of, uh, of fundraising, I believe um, one of the beautiful things about Islamic Relief is some of the domestic initiatives that we have in place. And this is how I actually got uh, familiar with Islamic Relief, an initiative called Day of Dignity. And Day of Dignity is an initiative where we receive uh, brand new household items, clothing, and we go to neighborhoods in need and we deliver it to them. Um, I remember we did, an, we did a Day of Dignity event in Malvern, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in uh, in Toronto and we handed out brand new clothing items and household items right before Christmas um, I believe it was three to four months prior to Christmas and I remember one of the ladies and the coordinator for that community center said she was the most poorest of all those that they uh, that attended the, the center and what happened was we allowed each family to take three items so she was the first person and usually generally people take the most expensive items first three so what, what she did was she came out, she took three items, the most expensive and the best items, and then she stopped and she, she paused for a moment. And she said, you know what, I can take this, but what about those that are after me? And keep in mind, she was the person that was most in need. So she put back everything, took one expensive item, two regular items, and then she ended up thanking us and leaving. And the beautiful thing about this and my experience, and this is why I really love Islamic Relief, one of the things that it, it affects people and directly you get to, uh, to see it, is she emailed me after that. And she said, you know what, I really appreciate it. And for my entire family, it felt like an early Christmas, which really struck, struck something with me. So I think that was the highlight for me in Islamic Relief so far. Um, just seeing the effect and seeing how happy we can make families domestically. I like the fact that um, as being out on the on the ground and asking uh, communities and masjids to make a donation, uh, alhamdulillah, in every place that we go, we always get the big donors. Alhamdulillah, may Allah Azza wa Jal increase them. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we go to masjids and we ask for donations, uh, our team tends to, uh, when we uh, yell out or call out to people to come out and to make a donation, we also add a du'a for those who, to, who uh, donate. And I find that that du'a encourages more people to donate because they want to be included in that du'a. But what really moved me is that there are, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who are coming in really sheepishly and very, very shy, and they're like, okay, I just want to donate 10 or $15. I'm like, and I could tell that for them, that $10, $15 made a huge difference. That was, that might be their last $10, $15, but they committed it to Islamic Relief. And it might, like, 
we are all deserving of that dua, but they are the most ones that, that really donate with all their hearts. And they're the, they're, that money is the one that adds the barakah in everything that we collect and everything that we do. And may Allah Azza wa Jalla accept it from every single one that donates and helps us do the job that we're doing. Amen. I think just to, sorry, just to transition how Saad was saying to challenges, um, and then just going off of what Yasmin has said, um, about how people trust us with their donations and their money. And I think then as, a, as the intermediary between the donors and the beneficiaries, we have this responsibility and obligation to make sure that we're taking care of, of their donations and making sure it gets to the people who deserve them, who deserve it. And, and I guess that's a challenge for us to constantly maintain that and keep focused on what our main objectives are and on honoring that obligation and responsibility that we have. Uh, so talking about challenges, uh, just just to add on, um, I think the brand Islamic Relief. Um, sometimes people attribute uh, us to be uh, primarily uh, providing aid uh, to the calamities around the world, and and I think as an organization, we've made a strategic choice that uh, yes, we will help those that are suffering around the world, but we cannot ignore uh, the problems in our own backyard uh, here locally in Canada. And uh, it's, it's imperative, and we recognize this within the organization, but I think the challenge is to make sure this perception uh, gets across to all our donors uh, and to the, the wider community. That uh, yes, Islamic Relief Canada does have the infrastructure in place to provide aid where uh, it's impossible or hard for others to provide aid to it. And we are that intermediary between Canadians who wanna donate to these calamities, but we also, have a significant presence and our roots are uh, deep within Canada. Uh, we do not ignore the First Nations communities here. We do not ignore uh, domestic uh, violence. Uh, we do not ignore vulnerable age groups, whether it be uh, the, the youth and the seniors. We do not ignore the refugees that we're welcoming and, and that the Canadian government uh, has welcomed with open hearts and we do not ignore their needs. Uh, so I think uh, dispelling this notion uh, is, is a challenge for us and, and that's something that we continuously work towards to make sure internally and externally um, we help people everywhere, uh, both here and abroad. I think uh, one of the challenges we face, and some alluded to this earlier, we're, we're a young organization, uh, about 10 years old, and we've grown exponentially mm -hmm. in the last five to six years, I'd say. And um, that is a challenge in any organization to grow that quickly and that fast. Um, and really I, every year it's been exponential and I think one way we've um, been able to continue that growth is to add um, not just staff members but staff members who are committed a hundred percent to the cause and uh, with that I think we can continue to continue that exponential growth within the organization um, one of the challenges that I think it's more inward rather than all the external factors that we're facing is uh, a daily kind of check on ourselves of what we're doing this for. So it's something that we have to always check our intentions and make sure that we're questioning uh, the reasons for why we're doing what we're doing uh, and ultimately you know for the sake of obviously helping the beneficiaries and 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 those that need it most but ultimately we also benefit uh, in the sense that you know if Yes, we have a job and all this stuff, but at the same time, uh, being in Islamic Relief and having the name Islamic associated with us, whatever we do, we're always under that microscope. So we have to make sure that when we do our work, we are doing it with the, the highest level of you know the values that we uphold and making sure that we are asking ourselves more than once that are we upholding uh, you know the true values that we need to uphold because we are always going to be under the you know under the scrutiny of doing this for for Islam. So that's that's a challenge we have to always keep in mind. I can share one from the volunteer side of things. Uh, so I think probably the most common question that I get from volunteers is uh, do you guys send people to the field to help volunteer? I'm like yeah sure get in line, right? No. Uh, but the challenge for for that is encouraging or, or Making people aware that if you were to go to the field, maybe you'll help like two, three families, let's say. But 
telling them if you were to stay in your own community, your neighborhood, if you were to set up an event or create a crowdfunding page or even help with leafleting, collections, fundraising, uh, the amount of people that you can help through that, that impact is tremendous, right? Because then that's a that's basically a ripple effect. You're getting your own network and they're getting their network to get to know about Islamic Lake and the wonderful work that we do. Um, so it's it's I find that to be a challenge that I face uh, fairly fairly com like every single event that we'll go to, I'll always go into that question. You send people to the field, uh, sure. But uh, so it's that challenge of getting people to know that they can be part of the change right from home, right? And every single person has a part to play in that change. And no task is too small uh, because the impacts of that, you might not see it immediately. Like we give this example in fundraising all the time in Ramadan, uh, something as little as just giving out a flyer. Uh, you might not see the, you know, someone give money to you immediately, but that person might go home uh, or give that flyer to a friend and you'll see that come in eventually. Uh, and that could be a repeat donor from the sudden, something so simple as just putting it on the car or handing it out to them in Dr. John. So. Being an, uh, another challenge is uh, educating the donor. Uh, that's something that uh, is very important. And what I mean by educating the donor is sometimes there's a disconnect between uh, donor preferences on how they would like to spend the money, how, how they think it's appropriate uh, in terms of the amount and where it goes and, and really balancing that with the needs out in the field and and what our partners our RW uh, and our, our field offices what they tell us in terms of this could be some geographic areas that um, there's not a huge expat community uh, in Canada where uh, there's a lack of funding but the need is very severe um, it could also be that the types of programs um, it could be, um, when we talk about our, our orphan program and our, our cash transfer program, on how much is an appropriate amount to really uh, provide a long-term sustainable solution uh, to help this orphan. You know, does $30, $40 a month, is it really going to make that big of a difference into that orphan's life? Um, whereas a donor might want that one-to-one -one relationship on that smaller amount. So really educating uh, the donors uh, into these things, I think it, it remains a challenge, uh, not just for us at Islamic League Canada, but throughout this sector. Um, really balancing what donors want and feel uh, is, is the right thing to do, but balancing that to, to needs in the field and to listen to the people in the field, right? Listen to the community-based organizations that are out in all of these countries and, and letting them dictate and letting them uh, determine uh, their own uh, in terms of needs and, and what will make a long-term impact. I think just to branch off of what Usama was saying is that I'd like to add that we, we want donors to donate towards the cause and donate generously towards making a change and an impact in our communities. But along, uh, as an organization, we can't uh, just continue going from one campaign to another and then to another always asking for more donations to more no data donations <coughs> i think what we're from being in the field out with donors they're voicing that we want to know what was done with that money mm -hmm. so we want to we need to put some effort towards following up uh, like within a specific timeline such as R ramadan so then before after within the next two months we need to really be more uh, visual and share the impact that their donations have made and to touch them uh, and all the hearts that have donated because that will help them be more committed and more loyal to donating again and again and again and sharing the, the impact that they've made with others as well. And I think that's really important with the work that we do, that sometimes we forget that uh, the biggest impact that we'll have is on the donors themselves and being able to share the immediate timeline and the, the success that they've helped us uh, achieve. Oh, I think uh, just to add on to that, I think that that's the challenge in and of itself is that sometimes the demand from the donor is actually wanting to see an immediate impact or wanting to actually get an immediate update. Um, and that's that basically the challenge is that oftentimes we don't have an immediate update. So I can speak from um, somebody who manages the orphans uh, department and oftentimes what we promise the donor is the yearly update, not, o not only um, we can't promise on the time frame, but we usually say 12 to 15 months, but there's often times where there's a delay because of the number of increase in orphans. So uh, 
when that little demand is not met because of uh, a delay from the field is that that ch the challenge is then donor not trusting us and then withdrawing their donation because of that little impact but um i guess like from uh, from our end and from our team's end it's just a matter of like reassuring them and telling them that their money is actually making an impact um so rather than promising them an immediate update is what, what i think a better approach is really just to telling them that they will receive an update just wait a little more minute uh, wait a few more moments um just like they've waited a little more mm -hmm. um but it's 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 not that the money isn't being spent the right way it's not that the money isn't going to the beneficiary it's just that the update is going to be a little more um delayed or we don't have it as immediately as we anticipate it mm -hmm. um, yeah. i think one of the challenges from a fundraising outreach perspective but also works as a pro is catering to different needs of the religious groups um, within Islam itself. Um, so for example, we had the Water Bottle Initiative, which was a beautiful initiative, which catered to individuals, but also was detrimental to our relationship with other massages and other uh, groups which were, and who were large donors. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges from uh, a fundraising perspective, how to cater to different groups and how to um, accommodate every single one of them in all of our projects. And one of the beautiful things that we've created here at Islamic Relief is, uh, in a form of fundraising perspective, is having different, ha having employees that are from different sects. So we have Umair, we have Yasmin, we have Mahmoud, we have myself, who are all from different communities. And this itself will give us the upper hand, inshallah, and uh, allow us to move further as an organization. So I, if, if uh, we're done with challenges, I think the last segment of our uh, panel discussion here will be the way forward, right? Combining some of these success stories and what's worked well for us and things that we're proud of um, and, and, and with the challenges that we know exist uh, within our space and, and really what's the path forward, way forward for us as an organization, for us as the IRF family and even uh, our sector, the humanitarian sector. Um, so I can, I can start off, I think uh, it's imperative that we do not become arrogant and complacent. Uh, I, I think that's one of the most important things because it's easy uh, to say that, you know, past 10 years we've had exponential growth, we've done this and that, and we've grown this much in revenue. Um, but uh, a lot of that is, um, you know, a lot of that is external factors, a lot of that is the work that other people had put in before we arrived. Uh, a lot of that is the uh, all the work that our international infrastructure, all the field offices and our IRW uh, office in, in Birmingham and everything they had done since 1984 to allow us to, to come into Canada and to grow that fast. Uh, so it's important that we uh, remember that. Um, and, uh, and, and so and not become complacent and to keep pushing the envelope and, and really not looking as revenue as our only metric of success, right? We can't just have revenue as, uh, you know, what determines whether we're doing a good job or not, right? It has to be something more. It has to be about our beneficiaries and the impact we're having on them. It has to be about um, the way we're getting that revenue and, and the impact we're having on meaningful, sustainable programs and how we treat each other um, as individuals, as people, how we treat our volunteers, how we treat our donors and our beneficiaries. Just to add on to that, um, I think it's important as we continue to grow to hold ourselves accountable and not wait for uh, others to kind of point out our mistakes to us. So whether it be more um, visits to the field office, internal audits, trainings, just cultivate a culture of learning and development so that we continue to grow but in the right way. Um, and that we're constantly checking ourselves to make sure that we're, we're meeting the objectives that we're setting for ourselves as well. I think sometimes uh, when, you, when you hear about what's happening in the world, um, the challenges become very daunting and very, uh, uh, you can sort of head towards becoming cynical, but it's important to realize that every step forward is a step in the right direction. Every step that we take, every little effort that we make, um, has an impact, be it, be it now, be it later. Um, just as an example, um, we know that there's, uh, I believe, 10 to 15 refugees currently competing at the Olympic Games. Um, these are people who have been who've been taken away from their homelands, who are in new settings, but they're persevering. 
Um, if they can persevere, so can we. Um, and it's for them that we have to make sure that um, we allow the people in the future, um, that we give them the hope that there is people out there that are willing to put everything out there in order for them to, for them to succeed and for them to one day go back to their homeland and rebuild them the way they want to. Yeah, also moving forward, it's um, like I guess you should mention before, uh, earlier, we are the link between the donors and the beneficiaries. So it's sort of, um, it's also our responsibility moving forward that, you know, you make it easy for the donors to donate. Uh, you make it easy for them to carry out their religious obligation or to help other people in the world. Like we are that link, so we should make it as flawless and as simple and easy as possible. And that's something that we've been working on uh, internally as well, not only with our um, different, uh, I guess, management systems or the teams and the efficiency that we have in reporting back to our donors and um, allowing them to donate uh, through our donation form online or our pamphlets and just any interaction that we have with our donors. Um, I feel like it is our responsibility moving forward to make it as seamless and um, as efficient as possible. Also, I think we can't ignore uh, the changes in technology, right? Um, you uh, can't. You cannot ignore as, as a way forward. Uh, the world uh, is, is moving fast in terms of uh, innovation and advances. Uh, so if we don't continuously innovate and evolve with that, then, uh, then we're staying behind, right? And so, um, you know, whereas when you talk about uh, social media, when you talk about a customized donor experience, when you talk about uh, everything really being at our fingertips, uh, about having app, apps uh, in place and, and providing that customized donor experience, I, I think if we ignore that, uh, then that's not, uh, you know, that would be to our detriment. So the path forward is to continuously uh, evolve, innovate, uh, and, and grow. Uh, with uh, you know keeping abreast with with the technological changes um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, for us in the way forward knowing about the political circumstances and the growth of Islamic Relief Canada that we've had in the last 10 years is uh, for us to continue and to cultivate a, a mindset of collaboration uh, I mean for our community to be strong and for us to be seen as a benefit to humanity uh, we have to collaborate with, uh, you know, with other groups and uh, other religious groups as well uh, for them to see that you know, we're not just creating a culture of uh, kind of a siloed mentality and we are, we are here to benefit all of humanity. And I think we are in a position now with, uh, with our growth and how we've gone to start doing that. And as Osama had mentioned, with, you know, we're not going to neglect the, the Aboriginal community or those that are underprivileged or the communities that are struggling. But this has to be, and we have to have that mindset of collaborating with other groups to achieve that success. Um, just to, to also reiterate the fact that when we're out in the field or when we're talking to other communities, um, you get comments by our friends and our colleagues, oh my goodness, you're so lucky to be working with Islamic Relief. And we most definitely are. And if we lose sight of that, uh, this could be lost uh, more quickly than we actually realize. And as an individual, on an individual level, when we, we have to try to always on a daily basis, as Mahmoud had mentioned, to renew our intentions and make sure that our intentions and our goals are, are one and of the same and pleasing to Allah Azawajal. And when you sit down and make du'as, you make du'as for yourself and you make du'as for your family. But also don't forget to make draw for the team itself, for the organization, so that uh, not just the one that we're in here in Canada, but worldwide. Because the success really is in the hands and by the will of Allah Azawajal, and it may be any one of our du'as uh, and continuous sincere hearts that we try to strive to make as large of an impact as we possibly can. Uh, a lot of our ummah and our communities are waiting for a, a positive change our Muslim and uh, community around the world. It could be this, it could be right now, it could be today, it could be with Islamic Relief, it could be with this, the work that we do, that we're able to impact as many hearts as we can, to impact as many Muslims and non-Muslims around the world, to be able to show truly what the beauty of Islam is in the work that we do.
Do you have any other comments? Any other comments before I speak? No? Yes. I think it's also very imperative moving forward um, for the success of the Islamic relief and we've actually going out to the masajid and to the community who forgot this comment time and time over and over again is try to connect with the community and to our donors on a, on a regular basis not only when we need money, not only when a disaster happens, not only when Ramadan comes around which in the past is that's what we've been doing so I think as a team, especially from a fundraising perspective, from outreach perspective it's very imperative that we go out and we meet, we meet our donors we go out, we meet the community and we go out and we meet our masajids Alhamdulillah, Ustaz Sama Rasulullah, I'm uh, very excited, very motivated, very empowered, very happy because I can see in you the challenges, the success story, and the way forward. Uh, the challenge is to work with the young generation, to maintain them and to empower them and to enable them to drive the community. They have a great role to be uh, played by them. The big problem in the whole world, especially the Muslim world, is more than 50 to 60 percent of the population are young, but they have not been utilized as the most precious resource for the source of any country, whether it's in the Middle East, and in Pakistan, and in India, and Bangladesh, whatever it is. I celebrate you as a challenge. You are very difficult to deal with because your energy, your drive is 20, 100 miles a second. <laughs> and my air energy and drive will be five miles an hour. <laughs> so how can I keep the, 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 the pace between me and yourself? This was a big challenge. The success story is you are the drivers of a very young organization in the middle of the west of the west, in the middle of the far west. And you are raising your belief, your moral values, your message to humanity from Canadian soil. You are, you are very proud to be Canadians, you are very proud to be Muslims, are very proud to be humanitarian workers without any blinking. I'm very happy to be the youngest among the old. <laughs> so I'm 21, <laughs> you are 22, <laughs> he is 55. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it. This is when, when, when you get the torch to your son and your daughter, and don't frighten them and let them to lead. This is a success story. The way forward is in your hand after Allah decides. With the hand of Allah, then in your hand. It is because you are the people who are going to carry the torch of success, the Olympic torch to the top, the gold medal. And you are a part of a relay team we take from generation to give the torch to the second generation, and so on. 32 years ago, we had no telephone, we had no desk, we had no fax machine. Oh, no. You, you, say, you remember something called telex machine? Mm -hmm. Telex? No? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you remember something called telegraph? Telegram? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, something like. Tick -tick 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 -tick. <laughs> this is what we used to do. No computer. But now you've got all the technology, as Osama said, you have to compete, to be ahead of the technology, not just to use the technology. To be ahead of the technology. To use the technology in a way that had not been designed for. Okay? With less resources. The most resourceful resource you have is your brain. Our brain, which you are utilizing only 5% or less. What about the nest of the 95% of our brain? Has it? Sorry? Uh, no, it's a mess. She is utilizing 99%. <laughs> so really, you are the challenges. 
you are the success story and you are the way forward and this is the challenge for you to keep the three in you because you have to pass the torch to the generation to come you have to make your back to be the bridge that the generation will cross over it to safety safety for humanity and the most dynamic hadith which we need to conclude with it is what the Prophet said إِذَا قَامَتِ السَّاعَةِ وَكَانَ فِي يَدِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَسِيلَةِ If you can see the hour is there coming, the day of judgment. The sun is rising from the west. Okay? And you have a, a day small day tree in your hand. What the Prophet said in a very dynamic, uh, innovative way, just plant it. What you do is your role is to plant the tree. Don't wait for the fruits. When you plant it, you plant it for the generation to come. Even if you don't see the result, bend your back for the community. And I'm very happy and very proud that I'm with you today with a very young, dynamic, visionary, innovative team that Canada and the Far West and humanity will be very proud of having you. Thank you.